Um, hi everyone, welcome to our latest Facebook Live. My name is Zoe Clark, I'm Senior Self Management Programme Officer here at NAS. Um, I'm also a healthcare professional and I have AS myself as well. Um, and I'm really excited about our conversation today. I'm joined by Matt Daly, physiotherapist. Um, so, hi Matt, thanks for joining. Thank How you, Adam. How are you today? Yes, good, good. Uh, you catch me in the middle of a clinic, uh, but I've been able to secure some time to talk about uh, today's topic and AS in general. Yeah, I really appreciate your time today and, and your insights. Thank you. And um, I know in, in the post that we've sort of shared in the lead up to the session, we've asked everyone to please do get involved in the comments and chat because obviously, you know, we're talking about two people's experiences with the condition and there's such a wide variety of, of experiences. So yeah, we'd love people to get involved and, and share their experiences and advice too. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, I mean, before we get started, um, I'll just let everyone know that the video will stay on the page afterwards. We'll also pop it on our YouTube page as well. So if you can only join us for a, a short while, then do come back um, and catch up afterwards. Um, and before we get started, John, to tell us a little bit about yourself, Matt, just introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, so uh, my name is Matt Daly. Uh, I'm um, 54, um, originally from Dublin in Ireland. Um, various travels along the way have left me living now in Eastbourne. Um, on my job, I work as a first contact practitioner, clinical lead for uh, East Sussex NHS Healthcare Trust. Um, small team of us trying to work in primary care and in particular for AS, uh, trying to be um, part of the early diagnosis uh, process for uh, patients who arrive to their GP practice and are seen by first contact physiotherapists. Um, and I have AS um, and I'm currently doing quite well with it. Um, I have a standard distance triathlon on Sunday and then a bigger event later in the year. Um, so a taper week means that you get to back off a little bit on the exercise. And so that's leaving me pretty good. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so um, that's me. I'm in the, that sort of phase of things. That's brilliant. And good luck with the triathlons as well. Definitely rather Thank you. Than me, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so f for me, I guess uh, I, I kind of found, fell into that uh, from a football and running background. And um, uh, I never actually saw it as a way to manage uh, my AS and symptoms. But um, the various different elements, um, they kind of give you uh, lots of different things. Uh, so the swimming uh, is good for the weightlessness and for really reaching out and extending your body um, uh, because you're focusing on the swimming technique. Um, I'm an adult onset swimmer. And so my focus is on how to improve my technique. Um, but in doing that, of course, I'm extending my thoracic spine and I'm using my, my body in a different way. Um, and then on the bike, of course, cardiovascular benefits um, and uh, getting to see the outside world, which is nice whizzing by. And then fortunately, uh, you know, I'm able to, to run and, and that brings different, um, different aches and pains. <laughs> That's brilliant to hear. And um, I'll definitely be picking your brains. Um, we've got later, later in the year, we've already scheduled in the sports um, live sessions. It'll be really great. Everyone watching, if you're interested in hearing more about that experience sure. with that, we'll definitely delve into that and how you got into it and, and everything. That's brilliant. And um, I mean, so today we're chatting a little bit about sort of men and access by and their experiences. And um, we have shared the, the link to a previous video we've done on women and access by with Dr. Helena Marco Ortega. Um, but I thought today it might be sort of a good starting point, I guess, for the conversation would be something that I think commonly comes up when I talk to, to men on the helpline is kind of the, the cultural and identity expectations of men and how that can be a challenge when you're managing a long-term condition. Um, do you want to touch on that maybe a little bit, maybe with your experiences or with patients? Yeah, um, I, I, so I, I guess making a reference to my own um, worldview is informed by my upbringing. Um, so I'm male, I'm middle-aged, I'm, I'm on a good salary in the NHS and uh, I'm, 
I'm informed about my health, fortunately being a physio. So m- my perspective on that kind of, I guess, have to be taken in the context of all of those things. Um, I guess from a professional point of view, what we know is that men typically don't engage with uh, healthcare. Um, and, and there are social and cultural reasons for that. Um, you know, some of the statistics around um, serious conditions like uh, cancer and suicide, uh, they are higher rates for men. Um, and, and I suspect the barriers are um, there because of how men see themselves and um, how they position their um, symptoms or their health problems in their lives. Um, and, and, you know, again, the identity of the man in, in society perhaps is about being the breadwinner and um, to take on big challenges um, and uh, what comes with that is admitting that you may not be up to all of that and uh, I think that can affect your identity as as a man obviously not that that wouldn't affect your identity as a woman um, but it's uh, I guess in terms of how you view yourself and and sitting in in society so um, yeah, then, then I think when men interact with other men, uh, there's, a, there's, there's an emotional vulnerability that you, you need to be able to share your health problems. Um, and that's quite nerve wracking because in some ways you're, you're admitting you're less than in some way or weaker or uh, deficient, if you like, in some way. And so you have to kind of, feel secure in your friendship group or social environment to be able to do that and life's not always easy and you don't always have that peer group um so i think yeah that the, there are lots of reasons um i think what's interesting too about as is um radiographically we see more significant changes on imaging uh, with as in men but women have a higher disease burden and longer delay um, in, in terms of getting that diagnosis. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, I think, quite interesting that we've got the harder evidence sometimes when it comes to radiology. And I think when you've got more factual information that the x-ray shows this, this, and this, and therefore it's more an accepted um, uh, diagnosis if you like whereas <clears throat> I think more challenging for women with peripheral problems and uh, enthesitis is kind of harder evidence uh, to gather makes it more challenging challenging for women so it, in some ways getting the diagnosis if you like with the hard evidence enables you to be able to go you can hang your hat on that condition um, and so the acceptance of it if you like that, that, that's one, one part of it. Um, you know, again, we know from, from health information and, and research that men are not terribly good uh, at managing their chronic conditions. Um, and, and again, that can be because of how men position that in, in their lives and, and their priorities or attention. Um, fortunately, I, I, I don't suffer a lot with fatigue. Um, but fatigue is a symptom. Again, you know, a man being tired all the time for no apparent reason. Uh, it's always a hard one medically to explain that. And, and again, um, you know, maybe you have kids that you want to play with or they want you to come out and kick a football with, but you're just exhausted. Um, that affects your perception of yourself and your relationship with kids and um, things like that. So, yeah, I think they do bring unique differences. Obviously, not speaking for all men, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the big caveat for this whole conversation, isn't it? It's, you know, we are talking very generally, and yeah, absolutely. If anyone wants to share their experiences or their advice, you know, on, on these issues that we're talking about, then please do put that in the comments because it, it will vary from person to person, and 
depending on your situation. Yeah. 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 And I, I think um, you know, regardless of where someone is on the on the gender spectrum, I think with axial scar being a condition where your symptoms fluctuate, I think that can be really challenging as well. Um, and particularly with it, you know, unless someone has strong postural changes or they're using something visible like a brace or a mobility aid, it's essentially an invisible condition. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have any this is a massive question, any advice for anyone in terms of kind of managing that and that communication in terms of when People can't tell from looking at you how you're feeling. Yeah, um, like all invisible uh, illnesses or disabilities, um, we almost feel, I think, that we have to justify uh, to the wider world, unless you have a wheelchair or an outward device. And, and you know, I think in some ways you may share similar um, challenges that people with mental health problems have. So, you know, you, you, you appear to people in society in a certain way. Um, I think, for example, when you talk about, let's say you've got sacroiliac related pain um, and how common low back pain is in society. And so if you're talking about uh, struggling with a flare in your SIJ related pain to some people, you know, that's your everyday back pain and, and we all get it. And why are you complaining about it? Um, <clears throat> and so um, I think that becomes a challenge to feel legitimate in, in, uh, in what you've got. Um, I, I guess uh, the way I tend to look at it is a bit about, so I see myself as a bit of a, a champion to, to try and, tell people who just don't get it. I feel like I've got a, an amazing opportunity to say, and this is what this kind of condition is. And when they're bored, they can, they can walk off. But um, so, so framing it sometimes in language that uh, people can get, um, like liking it to rheumatoid arthritis, like, um, you know, this is an immune condition. So what's that mean? Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel like that part of what I do is to educate so people can understand. And if the, then the empathy follows and you feel like, ah, oh, you know, I've, I've helped inform someone else, then, you know, I've had people going, I've never, my mom still doesn't fully get what, what I've got. Um, and um, so I continually have to explain. And, and, and even the, the word spondylitis is quite a mouthful for, for Joe Public, and uh, so yeah, I, I, I tend to deal with it by hopefully seeing it as an opportunity to to provide some education, and um, maybe just throwing in some challenging questions like, "Have you ever heard of it?" And you know, maybe referring to some famous people and saying, yeah, "That's what they've got. And this is similar." And um, you know, we have ups and downs, and good days and bad days. And today is a particularly tough day so bear with me type of thing mm. that's really helpful and yeah because we, we found that in terms of you know surveying the public mm. finding how many people know about it and so few people know about it and you know even when it's in the press quite often it's referred to as a rare condition but actually it affects one in 200 people in the uk one in 200 adults so it's it's really common <laughs> it's as common as ms and parkinson's combined but most people if you ask them they'd know at least MS or Parkinson's, but yeah, um, yeah. that's as far and the whole mouthful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I think NAS is, is, is doing a fantastic job in, in trying to educate the world, educate clinicians for, um, so, you know, even this morning, I had a lady who presented with an Achilles tendon problem um, and she subsequently had surgery, but she's also presented with, um, Achilles tendon related pain on the other side. So um, late 40s, uh, no real history of why she would develop it. And so, you know, you're quite sensitive to perhaps early signs of enthesopathies. Um, and part of that, I think, is because I've got that condition and so I'm sensitive to it. But also, um, you know, in, in not wanting to miss an early sign for someone who may go on. Um, and that has happened through the through education, really. Um, 
So I'm also involved with another group called A Stretch, who are some um, uh, physiotherapists who are interested in um, furthering a greater understanding and research and uh, around AS. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think seeing myself as an as an educator uh, sort of helps. It helps me uh, to to feel useful in explaining. Um, the condition and, and uh, then how people can decide to be empathetic or sympathetic after that. We really appreciate and really appreciate you coming on and talking about it you know in this capacity as well because it, it is different I think sometimes when you have the, both those hats the healthcare professional and the patient it's sometimes difficult to kind of straddle both sides so we really appreciate you sharing your experience yeah. today. One of the questions we, we just chatted about before we went live was uh, um, about uh, yoga um, and uh, you might even extend that conversation to Pilates. And, um, you know, it is interesting how yoga and Pilates have very strong feminine connotations to, to them. Um, and so, you know, some men would go, well, I've got my, I'm not going to a yoga class to hang out, you know, and, and exercise in front of women with women for exercises that are really for women. Um, and um, I, I, I think, <clears throat> again, the way the public perceives certain exercises. So, you know, I mentioned triathlon and, and that is, you know, a, a, an odd sport because uh, it combines a variety of things. Um, uh, but weight training, you know, we also have similar challenges with women uh, viewing the free weights area in the gym as not a place for them because it's you know filled with aggressive men um, throwing weights around and so as a society I think we've got a good, good hard look at ourselves to take the gender away from exercise and then see it as it's what value so when I'm when I'm in my professional role and I'm trying to match people's uh, desires to improve their physical activity either with AS or, or with other things we're looking for things where um, they've got some cultural values around or thoughts on exercise and uh, I have mentioned Pilates as a form of movement or yoga to men and, and you know oh, you know I'd rather you know it's not for me um, whereas you know we need to share the value of, of all of it um, at the end of the day if you're moving, that's a great thing. And if you're moving with less fear and confidence, then that's a big win. As to the discrete value or benefit of Pilates over yoga or yoga over strength and conditioning, I find those conversations to be quite divisive and they split it up. Uh, if you love yoga and you find, you know, your body feels better for it and some days you're feeling not so good or not so mobile or not so strong well that's okay within the context but you know um, so for me it I, I need to get through some of our perceptions uh, around uh, exercise forms because they're all good um, and you're only going to benefit from the exercise that you do <laughs> yeah, absolutely and i will shamelessly plug it seems like a good opportunity we have some uh, some pilates and yoga videos on our youtube page and on our facebook page from previous lives and um yeah and jamie and jeff who run yoga for as um yeah they're, they're really great they've done a few lives for us so if anyone's interested really? in trying out do head over there <laughs> yeah you can yeah do it from the comfort of your own home and see if you like it to begin with as well <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I say, that sometimes the gym or the swimming pool with our body image and, um, and uh, even the unpleasantness of walking across the deck in a swimming pool. Um, and I've spoken to people who find the experience in hydrotherapy pools, which have that kind of clinical element to it, to be very different to a public or a swimming pool or a private uh, gym. Uh, and, and there's that visibility when you're in your swimming trunks and, and how maybe your posture is, is different to the average person. And um, so, yeah, um, I kind of think uh, the way I, I would see this is, and I help people to think that their exercise is their medicine. And um, it's a necessary part of 
having you know a um, more comfortable and healthy body and if we see it that way then that might help uh, to engage a bit more and, and break down some barriers if you, if you have some uh, around adopting certain exercises taking the gender away from exercise yeah absolutely and i think sort of going back a little bit into it sort of links in with exercise sort of self-care in general i know Jeff yeah. just did before the session about how you know sort of some men do find self-care in general difficult to to get into i think it links back in i think to what we're saying about in terms of expectations of men to you know even the horrible term like man up you know oh yeah. we don't need to do self-care just get on with it is there yeah. any any advice i guess for, for any men who feel like there's that that pressure to not engage with it yeah um i, I think I, I think the phrase self-care immediately um has some challenges for for fellas um because because of all of the things that that comes with there's a softy your you know softy element to you needing needing self-care whereas um you know banter um crack as we might say in ireland um and uh social interaction can help depression it can help your mood um and so i, I think for me, self-care uh, probably, in terms of how you phrase it, and uh, it's probably got to have um, different elements to it. So I might say something like um, exercise is quite important for self-care because um, of, of how it makes you feel and, and meeting your pals, wherever that may be. Um, and uh, you know, almost de-emphasizing some of the secondary benefits of, of the physiological effects. Um, but then being out in the uh, out in the fresh air and out in nature. Um, so, you know, maybe thinking about an exercise or a, again, it's linking that um, red wine, chocolate, uh, socializing. Um, you know. Uh, a tight knit community, so family for some people, all of those things are self are self care. Um, and uh, I'll use references like talking about uh, your rechargeable batteries, you know, and, and how spending time with some. Remember the last time you went out with your pals, or remember the last time you went for a walk, um, and how that made you feel. And and if we try and emphasize this recharging element to the batteries, then we're kind of getting self-care by surreptitiously, by phrasing it differently um, and, and looking at healthier behaviors, but, but phrasing them that way, uh, I think. Um, you know, my, my, I'm 54, so self-care for me uh, <laughs> could mean moisturizer and, and putting conditioner in my, <laughs> when I'm washing my hair. So, uh, you know, and uh, it, things like that uh, might come to mind. So I think the branding around self-care for men has probably um, got to be shared with men in, in through different language. That's really helpful. And I'd love if everyone watching, if you could share in the comments how you recharge your batteries, because I bet people come up with such different things. So please yeah. do share with us. Um, Oh, we've got a comment from Robin that's come in actually. He said um, uh, that he joined a gym a few months ago for the first time, having done my physiotherapy exercises daily for 30 years. Um, started doing yoga after dabbling with it for a few years by joining a weekly class and doing a pump class and circus class. It can really hurt, but over time it's helped significantly. Um, but he's dominated by ladies. There can be 24 in a class and I'm the only male, but I focus on the benefit of it for me, not who's there. And that's um that's really good to hear. I suppose that comes with the philosophy of yoga as well. It's sort of getting you in, in touch with your own body and sensations rather than the outside world. So um it's fantastic yeah. that it's helped so much, Robin. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And um, you know, at the same time, there's Robin who who's clearly finding a drive to um to persist and uh and I love the variety he's talked about too, you know, the, from the pump class and um and fair play to him for going into an environment that uh, he's sort of feeling slightly uncomfortable perhaps about um, 
and 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 there he is seeing the benefits of it um so yeah i, I also like what he talked about was doing yoga for years and then transitioning into um so, so one of the things I, I found useful in transitioning from, so I used to be a personal trainer and, and fitness instructor in a gym, and um, I found the gym environment um, to be very uh, focused on, on the self. So very much what I'm doing, what I'm lifting and pushing and pulling and looking like. Um, whereas, uh, and, and that sustained me for a while, but then um, for me transitioning into swimming, meant I was looking at uh, technical aspects of learning to swim, just like learning to ballroom dance or salsa. Uh, the challenge comes with the learning. And, and I think that's quite important for people with AS to realize, you know, you, there may be a novel value to you doing a new form of exercise for three months. Maybe it's yoga for three months or six months. And then, you know, if, if that's sustaining you, great. But if it isn't, maybe giving yourself permission to explore a different form of exercise. Um, I myself like the novelty of new things. And so, um, you know, that works for me. Um, so I, I would say what Robin has kind of said is uh, he's, he's willing to look around and find the value in other exercises. Fair play to him. That's brilliant. Nice, nice to have a challenge and learn something yeah. new for, for, for the fun of it <laughs> yeah yeah and um, you know yes you can have a program like the gym uh, and, and exercises that talk about maintenance um, after a while you know uh, me as a physio I find selling exercise to patients that are relatively boring <laughs> you know a hard challenge whereas uh, a sport for example might allow um, a different structure and different uh, uh, mindset to going into it. Um, and, and again, um, going back to, I suppose, men and team sports, for some men, um, a team sport offers far more value than an individual pursuit. So uh, giving yourself permission to look around at other sports um, that have that social element to it is okay you know and um exercises don't have to work like uh, a drug you know there are you know we, we get in eastbourne here quite a young number of young people have taken up uh, indoor bowls and uh, you know you don't think of that and i don't mind that the bending because they're using their body and i don't mind that they're you know flexed over for a bit because they're generally moving more and that that's outweighs a whole range of things so yeah um do more do lots <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant um and before we sort of start winding the conversation reluctantly winding the conversation to a close because it's been really interesting so far i'm aware that you've got patient patients to see this afternoon <laughs> um was there are anybody watching if you have any questions for matt please do pop them in the in the comments um, and really, this is, you know, sort of the beginning of the conversation as well. I think it is important that we, you know, we recognise that we are trying to get people talking about this a little bit more, um, and particularly men sort of talking about engaging with things as well. Um, so, yeah, do pop any questions in, in the comments. But, um, Matt, was there anything else you wanted to share on, on the topic before we sort of wind things down? Yeah, um, I, I, like, I think the, the big one is um, trying to find um, an exercise that you enjoy. Because the one you do is the, um, the, the one that your body will benefit from. Um, uh, there, are, there, there, is a, uh, there are stigma uh, attached to um, men in healthcare. I think trying to form strong uh, friendships, relationships is, is really key. Uh, and feeling, trying to feel comfortable, whether it's a healthcare professional or or some friends or family those things are are the things that help to recharge your batteries um, for some people meeting others with as is helpful um, because of the shared sense of that condition um, i've seen people with with as who said that they, they don't want to talk to others um, because it makes them feel less normal um, and 
you know, again, you've got to work. Personalized care is all about what works for you. Um, and so if that's the case, and that particular chap was very interested in, you know, uh, sailing, windsurfing, all sorts of, uh, you know, out there things, um, and, you know, got behind all of that, and, and that's what worked for him. Um, so I suppose, yeah, um, it's good to talk, I suppose, and, and uh, men don't do that enough in a pub or going for a coffee with a friend, anything that helps um, that here we are, you know, with our modern phones, WhatsApp chat, uh, little funny texts and friends, all of that's quite important um, for men to feel part of a, a community, really. Absolutely, yeah. And I think just, yeah, having the courage to open that conversation up more. And from, from friends that I've spoken to, they've said that actually when they kind of start opening the conversation up more, it then it's almost giving permission for their friends to do the same as well. So it is, um, so it takes just that one person to get things started, I think, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And, and knowing when you're, knowing your, your boundaries um, as well. Um, so, uh, you know, after a while, there can be a bit of overshare and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think the, the ingredients around um, having a happy and healthy life, uh, certainly movement is, is in the top 10, uh, community um, and close relationships uh, is another. The, the other is, of course, being out in nature. And even if you're looking out the window at the sea or the trees or a bush, um, or whatever it may be, um, I think that's important that you kind of look to things that um, uh, are good ingredients for a, a happy, healthy life. Absolutely. I think that's a, a really lovely note to conclude things on. If, it, if you're happy to, I'll, um, I'll have a look for any other questions. Um, Robin shared that the thing that he sort of struggles mostly with is fatigue. Um, but he has said, found that being active helps with that as well. So that's really great to hear. Mm. Yeah, and Philippa um, says, I agree, being active is very important. Um, she doesn't attend conventional classes, but has three rescues that she walks every day, an ex race horse that she looks after. So, wow, yeah, so they, they help me by making me do stuff every day. But yeah, yeah. got your yeah. accountability there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, again, my conversation was around sport. So, it gave me the structure to train regularly, which is kind of doing my physiotherapy by stealth. Um, and, and, you know, dogs need a walk, definitely. Um, you know, that's another interesting dynamic is the value of pets um, for helping us and, and the bonds we have with, with them. Um, and, and suddenly, the, you know, we are responsible for their lives, but we have to exercise them and, you know, I've heard studies about lowering blood pressure when we pet a dog and, uh, you know, well, cats are a, a different <laughs> different element, but they bring so much joy. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um, yeah. and, and the dogs, most dogs don't mind a, a bit of wet weather. So we've got to wrap up and take them out. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, they, you know, they respond in kind and, and value the exercise as well. So, yeah, brilliant. So many useful tips and such positivity uh, uh, for those, just Robin and, and I've forgotten that lady's name you mentioned. And Philippa as well. Philippa. Yeah, they, you know, these, these, are guy, these guys uh, sound like they're, they're winning. <laughs> Absolutely. Fair play to them. <laughs> I would say I don't have a dog, but I do have a cat and he keeps me exercised just up and down the stairs whenever he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very good therapist as well. <laughs> Yeah, 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 they they listen, don't they? They yeah. really do. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Um, so you've got um, yeah, I've got a comment coming in. I'm really sorry. I'm probably going to pronounce your name incorrectly. Uh, Prachalitha, um, who's had AS for ten years, and um, you've tried hydrotherapy, um, but don't know how to swim. Unfortunately, the local swimming pool doesn't have classes for adults, so there's not much way around that is there unless there's someone privately who does who does the classes yeah so there are a couple of um there are people who have uh something called an endless pool um mm -hmm. 
so that there are uh, there's a great group called um, Effortless Swimming, um, and you, Effortless Swimming coaches um, set up a business and they have these pools where they have a motor driving the water towards you. Mm -hmm. Some have cameras and uh, videoing. Um, so you, you can, for example, uh, go and have a session or two with them um, if you want to have your stroke analyzed or confidence building in a particular stroke. Uh, so swim smooth and effortless swimming are to and, and they have a network of coaches and trainers around if, if you can't get to the pool so by getting your confidence up in one of those endless pools means that then when you go into the public pool you you, you know you just you're putting all of that learning into into practice and maybe that would be what will help your confidence that's really helpful thank you um wonderful so we've not had any more questions coming in but what i'll keep an eye over the next few days and if anything else comes up then um for anyone who's watching on catch up then we can go back and answer those um but thanks again matt that's been a really really rewarding conversation i think and great to get that conversation started as well so i'm looking forward to seeing if anyone else shares their experiences and advice in the coming days too yeah terrific thank you for having me and uh yeah it's a shame we can't get to see everyone's faces but uh it's good yeah. to hear you're listening out there and i hope you have a good rest of your day and and uh uh, stay uh, healthy and, and active. Wonderful, thank you. And just before I sign off, I'll just let everyone know our next session is going to be on Wednesday, the 22nd of June, um, and we'll be joined by Colin Beaver, who's matron and senior clinical nurse specialist. And he's going to be talking about uh, medication, separate to biologic medications. Um, we've covered that in a previous session, so we're going to go over all the other medications that are available to people with axial scar. Um, and I will pop some links in the comments to, as I mentioned in the previous video on women in axial spa. Um, we recently created a new web page talking about relationships and intimacy and all our top tips for that. So I'll link that. And also finally, a, a short feedback survey. So we'd love to get your feedback on these live sessions and for you to tell us what you'd like us to run sessions on in the future as well. Um, wonderful. So thanks again, Matt. That's been really fantastic. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you in the future when we're chatting about sports as well. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Have a good Cheerio. rest of your team. Bye. Yep. Bye now.